Have you seen these giant RCA sound cartridges from the late 50s? If you're a fan of the Tecmon channel, I'll bet you have. His video demonstrating a mono RCA sound cartridge player has racked up over 1 million views. In this series, I'm going to demonstrate the stereo version of his player, but before we do that, we've got a lot of work ahead. That's because unlike Tecmon's player, which just needed a new belt, ours is producing no sound at all and is in pretty rough shape. Now, before I get into the restoration of a device, I usually like to present some background history. But in this case, Tecmon has done such a good job of doing just that. I recommend you check out his video to learn more about how these giant cassettes came to be. I will add, though, that Tecmon didn't really cover the market where I first encountered these cartridges, and that's in language education. In the early 80s, I took high school Spanish, and our language lab had a pretty fancy, although desperately out-of-date studio, using a system of RCA sound cartridge players. At that time, I was heavy into compact cassettes, so naturally I was fascinated by these cartridges that appeared similar, but were almost four times as large. Forty years later, I finally own one of my own players and am eager to rekindle some memories. This time, though, the goal is to listen to the many stereo music cartridges I've purchased and not Spanish learning programs. Vamos a empezar! Okay, I've got the old RCA cartridge player on the bench. Not quite sure how to open this up. Let me remove some screws and some knobs and see how far we get. You do see a screw here. Just going to assume that the knobs are in the way and remove all those. Okay, now I want to flip the unit over and remove the screws on the bottom. And when I do that, I just want to make sure we don't put too much pressure on this lever here for the speed control. And I have some of these soft blocks I can use to prop this up. Let's give that a try. There are four screws on the bottom. Let's remove those. There's the first one, rather rusty. So far, all the same size. Ah, okay. There's our top panel. It's in actually very good condition, just a little dirty, but uh, no cracks at all. Let's set this aside. We can see our indicator tube, and there appears to be some instructions on this label. It says to service tubes and remove motor board, remove four red screws and block handle in extended position. Place in rewind position and lift right side of motor board partially and disconnect speaker leads from transformer and lift out motor board. Okay, so let's give that a try. And the four screws it's referring to appear to be one here, one here, another here, and where's the fourth? Perhaps this one in the red has just been removed a bit. Let's take the red pill, I mean remove the red screws. Hopefully these are all the same size. There's one. So we don't get them mixed up later. Two. So far all the same size. Three and... Yeah, I'm guessing the fourth one is this one here. Yep, same size as the others. Now it's saying to block the handle in the extended position. And I think what they mean by that is to put a block in here to keep the handle in its pulled out position. It's a little too much. Let me get something a little thinner. I don't want to break it. Maybe I can just stick a rag in there. Now it's saying to lift the right side of the motor board partially and disconnect speaker leads from the transformer and lift out the motor board. Okay, let's try lifting this. Okay, 
The speaker leads are here. Can you see that? Let's disconnect those. And I think, can we lift it all the way up now? There we go. Here's the inside of the cabinet. This piece appears to just set in place like that. Let's set this aside. And let's flip this over and take a look. Looks like we lost a piece here. Piece of wood, like a wood dowel. Not sure what that's for. We'll set that aside for now. And when we flip this over, we've got to be very careful about the eye, the counter, and this lever. Okay, and right away I can see a couple of things. First of all, our requisite dead critter. And like that Kenwood amp, again in this case, a dead spider. Who knows how long that's been in there. Here we can see the remnants of a belt that we'll need to scrape off and find some new belts for this unit. Underneath our motor, we have a selenium rectifier. Probably going to want to replace this with a diode. We have a multi-capacitor electrolytic with uh, 80, 50, 50, and 25 microfarads inside. We'll probably need to replace this as well. And we have three tubes here, which we'll need to test. And it looks like the bulk of the electronics are going to be behind this metal shield, which should help keep the unit nice and quiet and shielded from noise. Let's remove the shield and take a look. Looks like they really don't want you to get in there. You can see they've actually soldered the shield to the main chassis. And even though I've removed the two screws, I can't lift this apart. Let me get my soldering iron warmed up and we'll remove this weld. Actually, I'll use the desoldering iron, and while that's warming up, there's one more thing we need to do to remove this cover. Here we can see these flanges have been bent to hold this in place. Let's straighten those out. Okay, okay let's see if we can remove this weld. That's a lot of solder on a large heat sink, so it's going to take a while to warm this up. It's starting to flow a little bit. Maybe if I put a screwdriver in here, I can try to separate those pieces. There we go. Okay, that seemed to do the trick. Ah, appears as though I missed a couple of those flanges. Oh, and I did miss a screw as well. Okay, it's just jumping to pop out now. There's our cover. Set that aside and take a look. Okay, it looks pretty good, nice and clean inside. Looks like uh, nobody else has ever been in there. Here we have another selenium rectifier. A couple of old wax paper caps that we'll replace. One, two, one, two, let's see about four. Some ceramics, some mylars. Okay, so let's get to work on this. But to make it easier to work on, let me install this into my chassis radio stand. Let me show you how that works. I've got the tape machine chassis secured to the chassis holder. This is actually what's called a radio stand, and I got this from radiostand.com. And you can see that the unit is very adjustable, so you can fit many different types of chassis to this. And once you have the chassis secured, you can very easily rotate it to get just the position that you want. You can keep it flat and work from above or work at an angle. And you can actually lock it in with these pegs. So if I want to work on the chassis at a certain angle, I just sort of find that angle and I can lock it in right about there with a peg. And there's also a peg for the other side. So this is going to give me great access to remove many of these components, to replace the belts, and to also insert cartridges into the player to test it out. Before we get too far into the restoration, I just want to make sure that the motor is working in this unit. So let's power up the unit real quick just to test this. The tape player is plugged into my current limiter, which is plugged into my variac. We'll bring the voltage up slowly with the Variac and monitor the current limiter for any signs of shorts. And I'll also be using the line monitor to monitor how much AC voltage is going into the tape player. Let's begin. Slowly turning up the voltage. Okay, I can hear the AC motor turning in the tape player. That's a good sign. And I'm not even at 90 volts. Let me go a little further. Yeah, let's just get it to about 100 volts, right about there. You can see on the monitor. 
The tape unit supposedly consumes 60 watts. I have a 200 watt bulb in the current limiter and we can see that it is dimly glowing. Let me rotate the chassis around now to get a closer look at the motor. Now we need to do this carefully as we have 100 volts going through the device. Okay, hopefully you can hear that, the motor is spinning. Let me just touch the shaft so you can hear that. Okay, our motor is working. Sounds like it might benefit from some lubrication, but good news, we don't have to replace the motor. Power this down. So I did order some belts that supposedly fit this unit. So while I wait for those to arrive, I'm going to start working on the electronics restoration. Now I'm going to replace many of these parts. But before we do that, let's just do a quick test to see if the tape player is actually putting out sound. I connected the unit's speaker to the output transformer and I heard no sound, not even a buzz. I checked the speaker with an ohmmeter and the voice coil seems to be just fine. But to make sure that it wasn't a problem with the speaker, I also connected a Minima 7 to the unit and got the same results. So there could be a number of things that would cause this. The output transformer could be bad, there could be a fault in the circuit, or more likely one of the tubes is bad. Let's check the tubes and then do some other diagnostics. I also want to make sure that the power transformer is working and the circuits are getting power. The AC motor is likely connected directly to the input power, so it'll run even if the power transformer is not functioning correctly. Let's do some tests. There are four tubes in the tape player. One is a display tube, which I actually can't test with my Dynajet 707. So we'll save that for later. Let's test the other three tubes. There's a 6DR7 tube and two 6EU7 tubes. Let's start by testing the 6DR7. This is a 6 volt tube, so we want the heater in the 6 volt position. And for this tube, we want our sensitivity set to about 32. Now we need to set our four bottom switches, A, B, C, and D. A should be in position 4, B in position 5, C in 2, and D in 3. Let's power the tube tester on. And the tester itself actually uses tubes, so let's let it warm up a bit. For our 6 dr 7 we're going to use socket 39. Let me go ahead and install that now. Now the first test we'll do on the tube is for shorts. I'm going to rotate the D switch into all of its positions and monitor the shorts lamp. If it stays lit in any of the positions, we have a bad tube and we won't proceed to the next test. If the shorts lamp illuminates for just a quick flash, then that does not indicate that we have a problem with the tube. Watch the shorts lamp and I'm going to rotate the D switch now. And you saw that we only had quick flashes of the lamp, so the tube does not appear to have any shorts. Let's put the D control back in the 3 position, and now let's check for grid emission. And for this test, we want the needle to stay where it is. If it moves upward, that will indicate that we have a problem with the tube. Here we go. Okay, no problems detected. Now let's test the quality of the tube. And for this tube, we're going to press the test 1 button. Here we go. Great, and you can see that the tube is nice and strong. No problems with this tube. Let's test the other two now. For our six EU7 tubes, we need to boost the sensitivity to 35. Put our A switch in the two position, the B switch into the one position, the C switch into the 12 position, and D into position five. We'll use socket 39 again. Let's insert the first six EU7 tube. We're going to rotate our D switch again, looking for shorts. Watch the lamp to see if it glows. Again, if it just flashes quickly, that's not a problem. Great, no shorts detected. Let's check for grid emission now. Again, we want to make sure that the needle doesn't move. No signs of grid emission. Let's check the quality of the tube. We'll use test one. Here we go. And you can see it tests very well. The tube is nice and strong. No problems with this tube. Let's try the other 6EU7 tube. Let's check for shorts. No shorts detected. Let's check for grid emission. No problems there. Let's check the quality. Again, you can see this tube is very strong. So no problems with any of the tubes that I tested. 
Let's test the audio output transformer now. To do that, I have my ICO audio generator connected to the primary of the transformer, and I have the tape player speaker connected to the secondary. So this will also be a test to make sure the speaker is working as well. Let's turn the audio generator on. I have it set for a one kilohertz signal and a maximum of one volt output. And I can slowly increase to the maximum output by using this control. Now, if the audio transformer and speaker are both working, we'll hear the one kilohertz tone from the speaker. Let me turn up the output and see what happens. Okay, great, I can hear the tone. Let me turn up the output. Yeah, very clean, no problems. There are three sections to the power transformer's output, a 6.3 volt output for the tube filaments, a 24 volt output, and a 130 volt output. Let's test the 6.3 volt output first. I have the voltage meter connected to pins four and five of the display tube. Let's power on the tape player and make sure we have our 6.3 volts or thereabouts. Turn on our current limiter, our variac, and let's slowly ramp up the voltage looking for about 117 volts on the line monitor. And here in the fluke, we're looking for about 6.3 volts. And I should note that all the tubes are still removed from the tape player. Let's turn up our voltage. And at about 117 volts input, we're getting about 6.82 volts at the tube filament. That's just about right. Let's move on to the next section. Let's test the 24 volt section of the power transformer now. And to do that, I've tapped into two of the terminals of this selenium rectifier. Let's begin. Turn on our current limiter, our variac. Let's ramp up the voltage. Looking for about 24 volts. And at about 117 volts input AC, we're getting 27 volts, a little more, 27 and a half volts, where we should have 24, and that's just fine. No problems there. Let's check the next section of the transformer. To test the 130 volt section of our transformer, I'm tapped into this other selenium rectifier and to this electrolytic. Let's give it a try. Turn on the current limiter, the variac. Let's ramp up our voltage now. And again, we're looking for about 130 volts AC on our fluke. Let's begin. And at about 117 input volts, we're getting about 152 volts on our 130 volt section of our power transformer. A little bit high, but it shows that the transformer is working. And of course, with a low, that voltage will drop right down. So our power transformer is working just great. So at this point, we've tested our power transformer, our motor, the tubes, the output transformer, and our speaker. And all of those things check out. So I think the best thing for me to do now is to start replacing these old capacitors and test some of these resistors. And we'll also investigate replacing the two selenium rectifiers. Let's begin. I want to remove this electrolytic can now as it's likely failing. There are four electrolytic capacitors in this package, an 80 microfarad rated at 250 volts, another 50 microfarad capacitor, and I'm not sure how many volts for this one. I'll have to check the schematic. The text on the can that shows the voltage is actually covered up with this blob, and this might actually be the remains of the belt. The third section is also 50 microfarad at 200 volts, and the fourth section is at 25 microfarads at 25 volts. It'll be difficult to find a multi-section can to replace this, so what I'll likely do is mount a terminal strip on the top and use that to mount our replacement electrolytics. If I rotate the chassis, you can see the bottom of the electrolytic can. And I've done some drawings and taken many pictures and videos of this area so we don't get confused later. Let's get this old can out of here. The first thing I want to do is to snip these terminals from the old capacitor so these resistors and wires can stay together. I might just break this terminal off first so that I can get in there more easily. Get this out of the way. Okay, let me get some big snippers. There's our first terminal disconnected. And our second. There's our third terminal. I needed to use the smaller clippers to actually get in there. Let me see if I can use these to remove the fourth terminal. 
Gonna need the big guys. Okay, all four terminals are removed from the can now. The capacitor is secured to the chassis with four twist locks. You can see I removed one here. There's another here, here, and another one back there. These also serve for the ground connection for the capacitor. And you can see that they've soldered these connections to not only make them stronger, but to also create greater electrical contact. So we may need to remove some of this solder to remove the capacitor, or see if we can snip these connections as well, and perhaps the capacitor will drop away. Okay, and hopefully you can see in there that I've removed all the terminals from the capacitor now, including the outer ring of solder lugs. Let's get the desoldering iron warmed up and remove the solder and see if we can get this can out of here. The solder sucker is all warmed up. Let's give it a try. I'm going to turn on the fume extractor so it might get a little bit noisy. Here we go. So I seem to be having more luck just using brute force to remove these lugs, just sort of twisting them. And you can see that our capacitor is starting to come loose. Let's see if I can't just twist that off. There's one piece, almost there. Okay, and there it is. Let's now test this multi-section electrolytic capacitor that we removed. Again, there are four capacitors in here, one at 80 microfarads at 250 volts, two at 50 microfarads at 200 volts, and another at 25 microfarads at 25 volts. Let's use our old Heathkate IT28 to see how much leakage there is. I've got the ambient lighting down to a minimum, so hopefully that helps you to see the magic eye display. Let's check the first section, which is the semicircle. Attach our ground to one of the outer lugs and our positive here, which is the semicircle. And again, this is rated for 250 volts. We'll test it up to that level. Let's begin. Put the tester into leakage position. Slowly ramp up the voltage. At about 100 volts, we can see there is some leakage and it's trying to open. Let's give it a chance. Okay, not bad. Let's move up the voltage to 150. Will it open? It's struggling. Yeah, the eye isn't opening at 150 volts. And remember, this capacitor is rated for 250. So this section of the capacitor has parallel leakage, just as I suspected and why I removed the capacitor without even testing it. Let's discharge this section and try another. Discharged. Let's try the square section, which is rated for 200 volts right here. Switch to leakage. Let's increase our voltage. 100 volts, it opened at 100, let's continue. 150, and let's see, will it open at 200 volts? It did, so this section is actually fine. Let's test the other 50 microfarad section. This one's on the triangle, which is here. Switch to leakage. 100 volts, good. 150, good. And 200, good. This section is also good. Let's test the remaining section. This is the non-marked terminal, which is rated for 25 volts. Let's give it a try. Leakage. 25 volts, looks good. Okay, so three of the four sections of this electrolytic tested fine for parallel leakage. One section did test bad though, so I'm glad I removed this. That wraps up part one of the RCA Sound Cartridge Player series. In the next episode, we'll replace the filter and wax paper capacitors, test the resistors, replace the seleniums, and I'll show you how I find the foil side of capacitors. Can we get some sound out of the old player? Stay tuned. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.